But my father, who was in charge of my education, he said, no, I think that you should go to a traditionally black college. You have not had any, enough experience with our group. So I went to Fisk University for two years. And Fisk was in, it, in its prime at that time. I enjoyed it. Uh, when I went to, to college, I weighed 98 pounds. I was not a social person. I was very interested in academic achievement and sports. And when I went to Fisk, I think it was a good experience for me because they made me a very well-rounded individual. It increased my social skills. It made me a better person. I could relate to individuals. I joined a sorority. I joined two or three clubs. But at the end of two years, and then I, I had decided that I would go to medical school. And I have to tell you, I have to backtrack a bit on that. Because when I was in my last year in high school, I told my father, I want to be an artist. He said, get yourself a PhD or an MD, you'll be starving in a garret. <laughs> so, so I guess that was my motivation for going. But, but I never left the art alone. I was still fooling with it all the time. So then, uh, at the end of two years, I packed up everything, came home, and said to my parents, now let me do what I want to do. So I looked around at various uh, colleges and universities. But when I had been inducted into Quill and Scroll, this is the International Honor Society for High School Journalists, I had been inducted in Hutchinson Hall at the University of Chicago. And I was just so in awe of this wonderful Gothic place and so forth. So then, when I came home that spring, I went out and talked to the uh, counselors and so forth at the University of Chicago. And I told my father, if I am accepted at the University of Chicago, I'm not going to be a commuting student. I must live on campus. So he said, okay, that's no problem. So I went out and talked to them, and they were so warm and so receptive to me. And I said, well, this is, I think this is where I'll go. At that time, they had never had African Americans living in the dorm. So that my roommate and I were the first ones to live in the dorm, but it was no problem. It was, it was a wonderful experience. The other girls in the dorm liked it. And when I looked out of my dorm window, I looked at Bond Chapel. I said, that's going to be something in my life later. But at the University of Chicago, they gave me two choices. They said, you can go five quarters, and you'll be have satisfied all of your requirements for medical school, or you can stay an extra two quarters and get a bachelor's degree. But you know, I wanted to do everything in a hurry then. So I elected to take the pre-med requirements. I went to school from eight to 12, one to five, five days a week, and eight to 12 on Saturdays in order to do this. And at that time at the University of Chicago, if you felt you could pass the course, you could register for the course, take the comprehensive, and then just go on to the next course. But I, I enjoyed my time there very much. I spent a lot of time at the Women's Athletic Club. I played tennis. They had no football team, but they had an ice skating arena underneath the football stadium, so we ice skated there. And then um, I just enjoyed it. Now, another thing that happened, there were so few black students at the University of Chicago, at the University of Wisconsin, the University of Illinois, we would all get together on weekends at somebody's apartment and party. <laughs> but this was a very enriching experience for me. So that at the end of, let's see, in September of 43, in September of 43, at 19 years of age, I had to make a decision about going to medical school. Then my father was at the other end of the spectrum. He wanted me to go to the University of Illinois, the University of Chicago, or Northwestern. I had had the experience of being in a traditionally black college, living in the dorm, being in a majority college, living in the dorm, and I said, I want to go to a traditionally black medical school. I, I didn't want to be the only female and the only African American in, in one of these majority schools because it was not totally acceptable at that time. I thought I could develop myself much more to my uh, 
best ability if I was in an environment which was very supportive of me. So I went to Meharry. My, I went to Meharry. My father had graduated from there and his brother had graduated there. And the dean of the medical school was one of my father's classmates. So, so I really enjoyed the experience very much. But I hated gross anatomy. I hated gross anatomy. I said, if I ever get out of this lab, I will never put my foot back in there. And the first month that we were there, we had nothing but osteology, all the, the human skeleton, all that. And I just, I had been the kind of student, if a term paper was due on Friday, I had it finished on Wednesday. And I never crammed for exams, I just studied all along. When I got in medical school, I just felt overwhelmed, just completely. You know, it was a new language, it was so much, and I said, I'll never be able, so I started crying. <laughs> and that's the day we got the cadavers. I started crying. <laughs> and I was crying. And then one of my classmates gave me his handkerchief. And that was, happened to be my future husband. <laughs> because I was, go I was going home to my father. I was a daddy's girl. I was going home to my father. The only, I needed about two more dollars to get on the train or plane to go home. Because I had paid all my bills and so forth. So anyway, we, I did very well in medical school. In fact, I didn't take the comprehensive exam in gross anatomy, because there were certain students who were excluded from it. So when I left that lab, I said, I'm never coming back in here. And then I had been fortunate, because at the University of Chicago, I took histolo histology and embryology and uh, biochemistry, because they only had one course there, whether you were a freshman medical student or that you just took this one course. So that when I went to Meharry, I just breezed through those courses because I had, had had the opportunity to have them before. And the professor who wrote the book taught us the course at the, at the University of Chicago and we had the same books at Meharry. So that was. So then I took the, uh, I took the curriculum at Meharry because I knew I wasn't a straight A student, but I wanted to be elected to the Honor Society <laughs> my junior year. So I sat down and looked at all the quality points and figured out I want to get an A in this course, I want to get a B in this course, and so forth. <laughs> so that by the time of my junior year, uh, I was pretty much on the path that I wanted to be. And I, one thing, I studied 40 hours a week. I would not eat lunch, I would go to the library and read, and then I studied from 6 until 12 at night, but I never cracked a book on the weekends. The weekends were my part, my week. <laughs> Then what happened is... OBGYN. Oh. Oh, well, let me tell you how oh, okay, I got interested okay. in pediatrics. Oh, yeah, yes. We had a visiting uh, professor in residence from NIH. Have you ever heard the term chicken shit used? <laughs> 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 Whenever you have a professor who asks things in the appendix, underneath the pictures and so forth, that's the term that we used for him. <laughs> this man... I said, I'm going to get him. So that I read the textbook twice. I read two or three journals on whatever subject we were having. And of course, I breezed through the course. And then I, at the end of the year, I said, I know so much pediatrics, I may as well be a pediatrician. <laughs> at the same time, I had a very unpleasant experience in medical school. I was a victim of sexual harassment by the chairman of the department of OBGYN. This man, it was nothing physical, but he just constantly, it was like a vendetta against me. And that went on all of my junior year. The, the exams were given like in uh, one, one exam at the beginning and one in the middle and one at the end. I had an A, a B, and he gave me a D. It's the first D that I had ever made in my life. And I said, I, you know, I put my things in my car. I was going to quit medical school. I got on the highway and I said, you're stupid. Go back. You know, you can't let this happen. So this went on all of my senior year. But then I went to the, uh, to the faculty senate and said to them, I want you to look at my academic profile. 
And I don't think this really re reflects that this, phys uh, this teacher can adequately evaluate me. So I requested another examiner for my senior comps. So they got the head of the department of OBGYN from Vanderbilt to come over and examine me. And he gave me an A, but then this other individual changed it to a B. But that's not the end of the story. You had an encounter with him on an elevator too, oh, right? Oh, yes, <coughs> yes. This is, a, he's, he was from Jamaica. We called him the Black Prince. He says, Miss Tena, did you get your grades? And I said, yes. He said, I gave you that for purposes of stimulation. And I said to him, I said, well, doctor, I won't call his name, but I said, doctor so-and-so, there are two things I want you to understand. I think I have enough brains to get through any medical school in the United States, and my father has enough to give me anything I want materially. So up yours. <laughs> <laughs> She wasn't sure she was going to tell that story, but it's too good. <laughs> then I guess we better go on to... Should we go on? Graduation. Well, uh, the graduation certificate. Okay. So, uh, well then, of my senior year, um, my husband and I were dating. Not my husband, well, my husband now, but at that time we were dating. So that when my family came to my graduation, I had an engagement ring. My father got out of the car and he almost fainted when I said I'm engaged. <laughs> he said to me, but your hand has not been properly asked for. <laughs> but anyway, he accepted it. <laughs> you know, what could he do? I had, I, had, I had the ring and I had made up my mind this was the chosen man. So that uh, at graduation, now I did not know this was going to happen to me. So my family was there and friends and so forth. And when I graduated, I got a blank sheet of paper. He withheld my degree, the same gentleman. I didn't show it to anybody. You know, they were in leather folders. I didn't show it to anybody, but so I had a blank piece of paper. Then uh, he said, well, you have not satisfied uh, the requirements for graduation. My family had been planning a, a graduation party for me for a year, and since I, when they found out I was engaged, they were going to announce my engagement. This was 10 days after I graduated. I graduated at the end of the summer quarter of 1945, because we were going to school in the 999 program four quarters a year. And uh, so I had to stay there. I had to scrub to go in deliveries and other things that he wanted me to do. So I stayed there. I did not go to Chicago. My party was the 10th, and I did not get on the plane until the 9th of September going there. And that's one of the pictures that you see. But anyway, I got the degree. Fine. <laughs> and then we're back to Bond Chat.